we're, we're in this section that I call calculating, where we make up a few things that we need to do to become proficient at doing calculations. So today, there's two things. One is I'm going to do some examples about calculating cross sections. But the second part of that is trying to build your, your intuition uh, because I'm using this, this funny theory, lambda phi to the fourth. I want to tell you what that is. I want to show you some things that are associated with propagators. And so let's, let's just do it. So come on, come on, come on, come on. OK, so first, I have a couple little things to finish up in the cross sections. One of them has to do with identical particles. OK, and in the cross section rules, there's a funny f factor associated with identical particles. So remember, we had the following form. We had integral d3 p, but some other stuff also. So let's call it p3 and p4 when we're doing cross sections. 2 pi cubed d3 p4 over 2 pi cubed. And we had this delta 4 p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus p4. OK? So that's our final state factor. We're integrating over all final states. But the, the point of what I'm about to do is that this overcounts the number of final states if the particles are identical. If they're not identical, then it just counts all the states. But for identical particles, it overcounts them. Okay, and why is that? And the best way that I know to, to show how why that is is just to do an example. Let's let's imagine we're doing some final states, and here's two particles coming out. And let's imagine I'm in the, the center of mass. Okay, so I'm in the center of mass. This state comes out with p is equal to oh I don't know ten ten units along the z direction. And this particle comes out with p is equal to minus 10 units in the z direction. OK? And let's con consider a different case that's also in this case, where this, the top particle that I've drawn here, so let's call it, we can make one, this is particle 3, and this is particle 4. And p is minus 10 x hat, and this guy is p is plus 10 x hat, z hat. Sorry, those are all, all those little mushy things are z hats. Oh, OK? Now, the, the basic point is if these are identical particles, this is the same state. Because you have one particle of what type going with minus 10, the other particle going with plus 10. That's the same state as here. And so these shouldn't be counted separately. But in, when you're doing this integral, you, you can do count them separately. You can just think about if they were different particles. If they were different particles, they'd, they'd be different states. And so they'd be counted in that. Here, you're doing the same integrals. You count those, both of those states. So they're really the same state. So if you have two identical particles, there's a double counting feature. So in the rules for cross sections, there's a one over a statistical factor, you know, so integral d3, p3, d3, p4, 
stuff and the, and the rest of the stuff. This goes, there's a factor of two there if you have two identical particles. And you know, if you, you really encounter this, but if you had, if you had n identical particles, it turns into n factorial. Because it's, that's the, the, counting, the over counting factor. It's pretty easy to do. OK, so it, the example we're about to do has this. It's, it has two of the same types of particles, so I'll stick it in that one. Okay. And the other thing that I need to do just to finish up this is the, the final gener generalization I did the case where I had two particles in the final state in the derivation, but in principle you can have more. You could have some particle decaying into particle one plus particle two plus particle three plus et cetera. So even something as simple as beta decay, where a neutron turns into proton electron neutrino, is an example of a transition that you can calculate as three in the final state. Or you could do scattering you know, nothing tell, tells you when you do scattering, you end up with just two particles. You end, often end up with more than that. You know, so what's, what happens when you do those guys? So those formulas are slightly different. But the, the change is trivial. So the change is if I have the decay rate, we started off as 1 over 2m. There's now this one over the statistical factor, capital S, which if they're identical particles. There's the integral d3 p1 over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega 1. There's the integral, uh, let's forget the integral signs. There's then an integral d3 p2 over 2 pi cubed. 1 over 2 omega 2. We had down here 2 pi to the fourth, leave a space there, delta 4 of pa minus p1 minus p2, and m squared. Okay, so that's the formula that we've worked on derived so far. The, the answer if you have more particles is very trivial. You just add d3 p3 2 pi cubed 1 over 2 omega 3 d3 p4 over 2 pi cubed 1 over 2 omega 4 etc. dot 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 and the momentum conservation is, is just continues also. Okay, so there's really no change except you also integrate over all those final states. And the same thing, the same thing for the cross section. This cross section had one over, um, actually my factors here are wrong. Let's see, it's two, two omega A, two omega B, V A minus V B, one over the statistical factor and the integral is all the same. So basically the rest of the stuff all goes the same way. It's exactly the same thing. This, this, what you add for each of these guys is the d3 p over 2 pi cubed 1 over 2 omega. Okay, That's called, I think I mentioned this last time, Lorentz invariant phase space, LIPS. Okay, phase space means counting states. Lorentz invariant is not so obvious there. That's, that's, it turns out it is a Lorentz invariant. Here's how you see what it, that it is. Let's just take a look at it. This is equal to integral 
d4p, 2 pi to the fourth, 2 pi delta function of p0 squared minus p vector squared minus m squared, theta of p0. Okay, so let's just take a look at that. This, first of all, this is the Lorentz invariant form. This, this is integrating over all possible components of a form momentum, so that's an invariant. This is the four invariant, four momentum invariant, p squared minus m squared. This tells you that the particle satisfies e squared minus p squared equals m squared, so it's, it's so-called on shell. It satisfies the energy momentum relation. And so all of this is, is Lorentz invariant, so that's, that's a good feature. I guess the other thing I have to say is that the, this delta theta of P0, it's a theta function. It means it's, if P0 is positive, it's 1. It's neg if it's P0 is negative, it's 0. That's also true. The energy being positive is invariant under the boost. If you, if you take a particle with positive energy and you boost it, it still has positive energy. It's a different number, but it's still positive. So this is all, this is also invariant. Okay, so that's it's Lorentz invariant. That's good. Um, and then to, to get from one form to the other, you just do that that delta function integral. You do the 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 delta function. Remember when you do the integral over delta function, you get one over the derivative. So you do the p0 integral, and this turns into then um, so well, but I guess I don't have to do it. Let me just write out here that, that the integral d e of delta of e squared minus p squared minus m squared is w with this theta function is 1 over 2 e. Okay, so that that gives you the the usual piece. Okay, and you did that 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 integral you did in the homework. If you remember the the homework on the finite temperature propagator, you picked up the two poles. There were two, a factor of two when you did this integral with a one over two e, and so this theta function is just put in just to pick up one of them. Okay, everybody said yes. Adam. Yeah. So what if you have duplicates of different species? So like two electrons and two protons. Then, yeah. Uh, would you just get a two factor? A factor of two from each of them, yes, exactly. Yes, good, good point. Um, yeah. Yeah, in, yes, that, that, that's how it would work. And if you're ever if you're ever you know confused, you go back to the logic here of, of how you count the states and say which which one how how many overcountings am I doing? Okay, but that's what you get. Good. Anybody else? Okay. So here's an example. Let's do an example. The these integrals aren't necessarily trivial, but they actually are pretty easy to do once you see the pattern. So we're going to do two of them today, and then you would do one in your homework, and we're going to then be experts. Okay, so I'm going to do this phi phi scattering, this lambda phi to the fourth. Where we've been working along there, we have minus i m. This is minus 6i lambda. That's what we've got so far. And the goal is to turn that into a scattering a cross section. We have the amplitude. Let's get to the cross section. Okay? And one of the standard tricks that's always the best thing to do is to work in the center of mass. Okay. And we'll do that, and then we'll transform to any frame afterwards.
Okay, so that's almost always what you do if you're calculating something like this. So in this case, all the particles are the same. So in the center of mass, we have E1 plus E2 is E, the total center of mass, okay, is E3 plus E4. That's always the case. And all of these are the, the same. Okay. We're going to use the following variables. Here's a set of variables. Okay, the, the standard set of variables for doing this type of process is one called S. That's a lowercase s. It's not the capital S. It's the statistical factor. This is the four momentum P1 plus P2 quantity squared. Okay. That in the center of mass, P1 plus P2, the vector piece of that cancels because P1 spatial vector is minus P2 spatial vector because we're in the center of mass. If they're identical, okay the center of momentum, technically. And so it's just the energies. So this is the center of mass energy squared. Okay. This, this, and, but the, the beauty of this is using this as a variable is when I have the center of mass energy in my final answer, I'm going to replace it by S. And now this is a, a Lorentz invariant, and so then I know this formula in any frame. Okay, so this is a Lorentz invariant. If I know it in the center of mass, it's E center of mass. If I know it, I go to any other frame, it's the same number. Okay, we won't use these today, but I might as well tell you about them. There's two others, S, T, and U are the variables. P1 minus P3 squared and P1 minus P4 squared. So 1, 2, 3, 4, um, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are the other variables. Those are the four vectors. Again, these don't enter our particular problem here. So we're not going to see these guys at all. But later on, when we do this at one loop, these enter, these are our variables. Okay, I'll have to review them back then, but that's, if you see them enough time, you believe you know them. Okay, so in all these cases, then all these two omega one equals two omega two equals two omega three equals two omega four equals the center of mass energy equals the square root of S. So all those factors there, two omegas are the square root of s. Okay. Our formula for the the cross section is d sigma is one over two omega one, one over two omega two, one over v one minus v two magnitude. The symmetry factor is a half because we have this two, two identical particles in the final state. Then integral d3 p3 over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega 3, d3 p4 over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega 4, 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4, p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus p4. And the amplitude is 6 minus 6i six lambda squared. So the, the matrix element now is the easy part. What we have to, to do is all these integrals. But they're pretty easy, too. And just we've got all these delta functions, and so it's just a 
bit of counting factors. Okay, so let's go through this. The starting on the front there, I have two omega is the square root of s, so I have a one over s from from those guys. In the center of mass, the velocities are equal and opposite, so there's a one over v, and v is going to be p over e. That's how we're going to end up writing it. There's the one half. I still have. Okay. So the the first thing we do is the easiest thing to do is to do one of these integrals here, the three-dimensional integral dp4. Gets rid of the delta, the three component of the delta function. Okay, so let's let's save d3 p3 over 2 pi cubed. These, I get 1 over s's from those two factors, 1 over omega. And the delta function I've got left over is 2 pi times the delta function of, well, it's the energy delta functions left over. E1 plus E2 minus E3 minus E4. Okay. So the way you write that is you write that as the square root of S is E1 plus E2 is the square root of S. It's the center of mass energy. And we have an and at this stage, we have p vector p3 is minus vector p4, so their energies are the same. So we write this as 2 omega 3. Okay, so I'm about to enforce that delta function there. And I've got 6 lambda squared. Okay, so we're, we're integrating over all these momentum here, enforcing the delta function, so square root of s minus 2 omega 3, okay? Then, the, um, what do I have here now? I've got anyone catch, I have a mistake right here. I have a factor of 2, thank you. So there should be a factor of 2 there. V1 minus V2. Okay, so these factors out in front, I now have 1 over 4S times E over P. That's E over P for a single particle. Actually, let's put the S squared. I'll carry that other S out, too, while I'm at it. I'm going to have a 1 over 2 pi squared. And now I have to do that to integral d3p. Okay? So that's p squared dp d omega in spherical coordinates. And the standard trick at this stage is to write this as p e d e d omega and here's the that transition if i have e squared equals p squared plus m squared then 2 e d e is 2 p d p so since i'm having to do the integral over the energy I want this to be dE instead of dP, so I make that transition. And so anytime you see p squared dP, you're common to write it as p dE, p e dE. And then what else do I got? All right, so then I can do the integral. This omega is what I call e. 
there's then a, a factor of a half from doing the that integral. It's this factor of two. You know, if this is d two e is the one over two. Anyway, you know the, the typical Jacobian from doing the delta function. I'm left with d omega and six lambda squared. Oh, and I let's say I missed something else also. I missed the PE, right? I missed PE. It's this factor here. I did the the delta function, so there's a PE. Okay, my P's ca cancel. My E's get turned into square root of S with a factor of two. I collect it all up. I end up with 1 over 128 pi squared f times 6 lambda squared. Is of one particle, of, of particle 3 or particle 4, OK? or particle 1 or particle 2 once I do the delta function. Okay, so they're all the same energy. But it's the energy of one part, it's not that it's half the center of mass energy. Okay, so when I have this E squared, the, in going from here to here, um, I've used E is one half the center of mass energy. The center of mass energy squared appears here, then canceled one of the powers of S leaves one power of S, and I collected f numbers, factors of two. Okay. Well, OK, so you, when you integrate over the delta function with DE, you get a half, right? Because this is 2E here, OK? So when you integrate, you get one over the, the I always have tr trouble saying this. If you have the integral DE, of a delta of a function, function of e, you get 1 over the derivative of that function evaluated at the point, OK? And so th this function is just 2e, so it's a 1 over 2, OK? And in this, that was that factor of 2 right there, OK? So we we spent time on this calculation on detail because that's what you have to do. These integrals with two bodies in the final state are always so-called trivial. You know, it's trivial in this sense here that you can do it with just doing the delta functions. Integrals with three bodies in the final state, like you get for beta decay, are incredibly painful. You'd think it's easy, but try doing it once. It's, they're, they're incredibly painful, especially if your matrix element has a dependence on the energy. Then it's a real art to do three body phase phase. So it's one of these pathetic parts of field theory is that everybody learns how to do two body phase space because it's so simple. And then you get down to some real calculation like beta decay and you have to, you have to work forever to, to get it to work. Um, but that's, that's the fact of life. So you won't get a homework with three body phase space in it. You'll just get two bodies. That's all we do. It's like when we do loop diagrams, everybody's good at doing one loop diagrams and nobody ever does two because it's painful. Okay, so I actually have a couple things to say about this. We are actually going to use this a bit. So here's some comments. Okay. Well, comment number one is this is good in any frame now, frame now. Okay. Um, S is P1 plus P2 squared is a relativistic invariant. And so you could evaluate that in the lab frame if you wanted. If one of these is a beam coming in, you just sit in the lab frame, 
make P2 be something at rest. P1 comes in with energy and momentum and just calculate out what this thing is. Okay, that's, that's then the answer in any frame. The second thing to see is that in the center of mass frame, there's no angle dependence. in the center of mass. Okay. Scattering is isotropic. This is this is actually very relevant for the interpretation, but just hold that thought for a moment. Hold this feature. Because this is useful. The third feature is that the non relativistic limit of this okay non-relativistic limit is S, so the momentum is small compared to the mass of the particle. So S just turns into M1 plus M2. But these are squared, which these are identical particles, so it's 4M squared. Okay, so this energy factor in the non-relativistic limit just goes to a constant also. So it's a, it's a constant scattering cross-section in the non-relativistic limit. And people who do, you know, condensed matter field theory, that's, this is going to be important. And the last thing I'd like to do with this guy is do dimensional analysis. Because that's what you should always do. And every you do a calculation, at the end of the day, you have to say, does this have the right dimensions? And so in the homework, I tell you that your coupling constant for the particular problem there is dimensionless in natural units. And so you should look at the your final answer and see, does it have the units of a decay rate? And so let's do that here. Lambda is dimensionless. In natural units. Okay? It was lambda phi to the fourth. Phi carried units of energy, so energy to the fourth, and the Lagrange density was units of energy to the fourth. The action is dimensionless, is the integral d, d four x times the Lagrange density. X carries units one over energy to the fourth. So lambda is dimensionless. Okay, one over F then is our only dimensional factor there. That goes like one over energy squared. But in natural units, one over energy squared goes like uh, length squared. Okay, because you know you have things like delta p delta x is h bar, which is one in, in dimensionless units. So one over p goes like x, and that's good because this cross section goes like length squared, and so that works out. Okay, so dimensionally this worked out. Then so if you had done this calculation and got one over S squared here, you would know that you made a mistake somewhere and you go back and fix it. Okay, questions on the calculation. All right. Now now this now's the intuition part. Let's go back and look at the non-relativistic calculations that we might have done. And so I'm going to call this correspondence. In old quantum mechanics, in the Born approximation, you would calculate d sigma d omega is this f of theta squared is the integral, sorry, is the absolute value minus m over 2 pi, integral d3r, 
e to the i q dot r v of r squared. Okay, and all the the angles sit here in q. Q is p one minus p three in this case. And so this there's the angles. Okay. Q squared goes like, you know, sine squared theta over two. Okay. Now first, what happens if if V of R is some strength times the delta function, the delta function potential. Okay. Well, then d sigma d omega is turns into m squared g squared four pi squared. Okay. The number isn't that important. I've just given it some arbitrary strength. But what is important is that this is isotropic. Okay. Much like our other calculation there. The other thing before I go, go on is, is case B. If Q, which is then, you know, this P1 minus P3 vector, goes to zero. So I, I'm at very, very low energies. Okay. Okay, so the the Born approximation then the e to the i q dot r disappears. So again you, we already know it's gonna be isotropic. Q is zero. If we define G is defined as the integral D three R V of R. Okay, if that exists, so if you have a finite range potential, then this this exists. So then G is less than infinity. Okay, if if you have a one over R potential, like you do for Coulomb potential, so infinite range then this blows up. You know, you have integral d3r times 1 over r, that's of course blows up. But if it's a finite range potential, so uh, that it doesn't blow up, then this is just a number. And again, then d sigma d omega is m squared g squared over 4 pi squared. Okay. So, this gives us our interpretation here. We we see that lambda phi to the fourth as a field theory is a model for a delta function interaction, delta three of x interaction. Okay, so very short range, or any possible fi finite range interaction at low energies. Okay. Now, the first of it is the first one is, is not so surprising. Let's just you know think about the first part. If we had uh, you know old quantum mechanics notation phi star psi of x, some potential, which is a delta three of x minus y, phi star psi at y, that you know, once you you just drop these, the you, this turns into effectively like phi to the fourth. It's you know 
phi is like the, the field. This is a field. Here's the field. So this is like phi to the force field. So a delta function interaction is like phi to the fourth. More interestingly is this, this one that any finite range interaction looks like a delta function at low energies is useful. So if you're doing, let's say, polymer physics and you have you know these polymers coming and they cross and they interact when they cross, that's a local interaction for a polymer and so you'd use lambda phi to the fourth as your model. If you're doing scattering of Cooper pairs, that's a short range interaction. So all these things get modeled by lambda phi to the fourth. Okay. It, the other thing I wanted to do along the exact same lines is short distance interactions with propagators. Okay. Because this also is part of the intuition of field theory. Okay. So let's look at the propagator. with um, m large. Okay, so the mass in the propagator is big. Okay. Now, we'll come back to what large compared to what, but it's... So we have I Feynman propagator of x minus y is in general d4q over 2 pi to the fourth i over q squared minus m squared e to the i q dot x minus y. Okay. Well, if m is large, every physicist would know what to do. You, you take that and you expand it, right? So this turns into uh, let's pull out the minus i, minus i over m squared, um, minus plus q squared over m to the fourth, plus dot dot dot, okay? e to the i, q dot x minus one. Okay, so. Uh, and then another trick that you might think of, just pulling out typical theory tricks, we have q there, q squared can tur be turned into the derivative, so it's basically box, d mu d mu, acting on e to the i q dot x. Because if I take a derivative with respect to x or y on this, it brings down a factor of q squared, okay? So I can rewrite this, and then once you do that, you can pull that outside the integral. There's actually, it's actually minus, minus del squared because of that. This is minus i, pull it outside the integral, 1 over m squared minus box over m to the fourth plus dot, 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 acting on the integral d. Q, 2 pi to the fourth, e to the i, Q dot, x minus y. Okay. And then lastly, you know what that is. That, that's, that's your delta function. And so we've manipulated this to write this as minus i times 1 over m squared minus box over m to the fourth of delta 4 of x minus 1. Okay. So now the box doesn't, doesn't act on the delta function. Oh, it acts on the delta, it does. Well, well you know, so you, the question is, what does box on a delta function mean, okay? I, I, I'll, I'll explain that later, okay? <coughs> um, but the, the first piece is the obvious piece. The first piece is the most important one that I want to get out, but let's, we'll do both of them. 
that when m is big, the propagator turns into a delta function. So it doesn't propagate very far. And so it's, it makes sense. It's the uncertainty principle. You know, if, you, if your mass is extremely heavy, you can't propagate very far. Well, this is the mathematical statement of that, that your propagator is a delta function when the mass is, is big. So if you're doing some exchange, in okay, case, so let's let's do something. That we we did this before as an example. We we exchanged. We have these chi's out here, chi's, and we exchanged the phi. Okay, that's there's something sort of like QED, and we calculated that matrix element. The Lagrangian was minus g chi star chi phi. And when we went to second order, we ended up with this propagator piece. So let's just, let's just look at what we had there. So at second order, we had one half time ordered product. I had the integral d4x, d4y, minus i g chi dagger of x chi of x phi of x minus i g chi dagger of y chi of y phi of y. Okay, and this, this was the time ordered thing. Okay, now when we're taking this matrix element, the chi's all act on external states, the phi turns into a propagator. <coughs> so let me just turn that, prop, turn that into a propagator right away. So I'm going to take this guy and replace that by the propagator. And then I'm going to replace the propagator, so this is i df x minus y which is then this minus i over m squared delta function plus, plus the, the, the second piece. Okay. So what comes out? Well, what comes out is the first piece is um, There's certainly a g squared over 2m squared, and now it's integral integral d4 x chi dagger of x chi of x quantity squared. So that's the first piece. I just use the delta function. I replace this. I get chi dagger of x and chi squared because of those terms. Okay. The, the second piece, let me just write it out and answer Bossom's question, is it's a, sort of the same factors, but then it's chi dagger of x, chi of x, box chi of dagger of x, chi of x box over m squared. Okay? So when you so when you have this the derivative acting on the delta functions here inside of an integral, what you can do is you can integrate this thing by parts inside the integral. You put it on the other stuff there. So I've integrated by parts, I put it on one of the chi's. And then you're left over with a delta function. And then the delta function gets act, so you, it basically just turns into a derivative acting on the interactions on one side or the other. Okay? That's how you deal with it. And I, there's a minus sign to be. To get all my factors right, I think there's a minus sign. Okay? 
So the heavy mass limit then has these terms. The first piece goes like 1 over m squared, and this is like m to 5 to the fourth. If you know Fermi theory of beta decay, there's two, two currents, act, two things acting at the same point. That's also the same effect. If the W is heavy, it looks like a point interaction. So the, but basically, this is the, the effect that we talked about in quantum mechanics. At low energies compared to the, the mass, we get this contact interaction, this delta function interaction. And then in field theory, you get the momentum dependence. in higher orders in the energies over the mass. So this goes of, of order you know, p squared over m squared, where p is the momentum of the external states. OK, when derivatives act on chi's, it gives you the various momentum around. So if you're just counting momentum. So the expansion then is, is of order p external momentum divided by the mass of the exchange particle. Okay. This, this is, the, this is the, the, when this is a small quantity, the expansion that I did above is, is legitimate. Okay. You know, let's just go back up and, and talk about the expansion. You know, I have a, it's a funny expansion in a way, if you think about it. Look, look at this. I'm integrating over all momentum here, okay? And so you might worry that, well, there's some momentum that I'm integrating over that are big compared to the mass, okay? So what, what is the sense of this logic here? Well, the sense of the logic is that when, when you actually apply this in a real calculation, this exchange Q turns into the things connected to the external momentum, okay? And that happens later in the calculation. But this expansion is then valid when all the external momentum are small compared to the mass. Okay. All right. That's actually the starting point of effective field theory. You know, if we have a chance to talk about it later, we will. But this idea of being small compared to the mass and simplifying the interactions, that's a typical thing to do in effective field theory. Okay, last calculation for me to do today is something that isn't short range and is not um, isotropic. So let's do the opposite extreme. So electromagnetic scattering. Okay, so now, now we're doing real photons and all that stuff. And so we're taking two charged particles, exchanging a photon, P1, P3, P2, P4. The momentum in the exchange here, Q, is uh, P1 minus P3, or it's P4 minus P2. Two. Okay, and for simplicity, I'm going to do this with scalars. So our Feynman rules we write out minus I M, M, capital M, is minus I, the charge of one particle, it's P1 plus P3 mu minus I charge this is a charge, charge on the second particle, P2 plus P4, we'll call it nu, and the propagator is minus I g mu nu over Q squared plus I epsilon. Okay. And we're going to just hold that for a bit. That's But my, the real purpose of this calculation, at some stage, if it was, if all these had the same mass, 
the rest of the calculation goes through just like before, okay? Because you just square this m squared instead of 6 lambda squared, and you can square that number, right? You just square it. It's a number. Um, but what I'm actually interested in doing here is doing the same calculation, so it's tricks, when m1 is not equal to m2. Okay. And you should be especially interested in it because that's what you need to do in this homework that I just handed out. Your decaying particle A goes into two particles that have different masses. So you have to do the same integral that I'm about to do in doing the calculation of the decay rate. Okay? So that's, that's your motivation. For us, it's just it's a bunch of algebra tricks. We, we're going to again work in the center of mass, the center of momentum, P1 plus P2 mu is going to be, again, the center of mass energy and no, nothing in the momentum state. And we're again going to write that as the square root of S and 0. But now, but now E1, which is the square root of P center of mass plus M squared, is not equal to E2, which is the square root of P center of mass plus M squared, M2 squared. So M, one's M1, one's M2, so they're not the same. Okay? So all of our stuff becomes a bit more complicated. Okay, so let's, let's do it here. So we've got in the center, the integral, we have d3p3, 2pi cubed, d3p4 over 2pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega 3, 1 over 2 omega 4. And then I've got 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4, p1 plus p2 plus minus p3, p3 minus p4. Okay? So, again, we're going to use just energy momentum conservation to, to do this. So starting step is the same. You do the integral over P4, the three components of that, and you're left with the integral D3. So there's 1 over 2 pi squared, 2 omega 3, 2 omega 4. Okay. D3P delta function of square root of S is the center of mass energy for minus square root of P squared plus M1 squared minus the square root of P squared plus M2 squared. Okay, P, P could be P3 or P4. I've just dropped the subscript. It doesn't matter, right? Because we, P3 and P4 are the same, so P center mass. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to use again this the integral d x delta function of f of x is one over f prime of x. Okay. And yeah. Okay, and so if the, 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 the function is this, guy, this function here, and we have to take one over that, the derivative of that function. So this turns into, so this, the, that factor is the same. This becomes p squared d omega. I'm using the dp integral. So this turns into one over the derivative of this quantity. Okay? One over the derivative of that quantity is the first term is P 
over E. E1 plus P over E2. Okay, everyone see that? But you know, I'm taking the derivative respect to P of the square root of P squared plus M squared is then um, 1 over the P squared plus M squared times P. K factors of 2 work out. Okay, and so this equals then 1 over 2 pi squared, 1 over um, 2 e3, one over two e four. Uh, I rationalize that it becomes p times e e three e four over e three plus e four. Um, I've shifted E1 in, into E, E3 and E4 there, sorry. And a bunch of guys cancel, E3 plus E4 is the square root of S. Here's the square root of S again. The, these e factors cancel and I end up with a remarkably simple for such a painful calculation. I end up with 1 over um, 8, no, 16 pi squared p, p over the square root of s. times the omega. Okay? So all that calculation went into that. It just I've stepped you through how you do complicated integrals like that. Why did we do that? M what M Oh, I, I just have—I haven't completed it. I'm just doing this phase-space integral right now. I, I still have a bunch of other things to do. Okay. Okay. The other factors. So that—that's—that's that's one set of factors. So B. Let's go label that part A. So I had to do—I had to do that that integral. The other thing I have to do is, that's different here is I have the the phase-space. I mean, it's the flux factor was it's 1 over 2e1, 2e2, v1 minus v2. Okay, that's, that's also now has to be changed because v1 and v2 are no longer the same. So that's 1 over 2e1, 2e2, p over e1, plus P over E2. The momentum are in opposite directions. The, 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 the velocities are P over E. P is the same for both of them. E's are different. Okay. And so this thing also rationalizes. It turns into 1 over 4P times um, e1 plus e2 is the square root of s. Okay. Now, I have to put it all together. Now, d sigma is 1 over 2 e1, 2 e2, 1 over v1 minus v2 times this integral d3 P3, D3, P4, 
2 pi cubes, 2 pi cubes, 1 over 2 e3, 1 over 2 e4, 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4 energy times matrix element squared. Okay, so the two steps I did above, I worked out what that part was, I worked out what that part was, and we put these all together, multiply by m squared. Okay, that's, that's our goal now. So this is 1 over 4 p square root of s. The factor up above there was, um, oh, there, it's sitting there. It's 1 over 16 pi squared p over the square root of s d omega. And then the matrix element squared is p1 plus p3 dot p2 plus p4 over p1 minus p3 squared minus m squared. We have to square that. Okay, and so this answer comes out to be then, and I forgot, I've forgotten my factors of Q1, Q2, is Q1 squared, Q2 squared over 64 pi squared F times this factor P1 plus P3 dotted into 2 plus p4 over, well, let's just call it q squared, it's the minus m squared, squared. Okay, so technique-wise, we've gone through the techniques for doing the more general calculation now, so you should be good for any calculation. You can do it all, and you'll have the practice of doing it by doing it. I think. The thing I didn't have time for and what I'll start the next class with is just interpreting this a bit better. This turns out to be exactly equivalent to not, if you take the non-relativistic limit, to the non-relativistic scattering amplitudes that we, we do in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but it also contains some more stuff and so talking about how it equals the same old stuff and what else is in there is the thing I'll start with next time. Okay, so again, intuition. Next time. But there's the calculation. Questions about calculation part of it? Yes? Okay, so it's... Yes, okay, okay, yes. So it's, the Boston's question is a, is a good one. Um, P, he, he commented that we did the integral without worrying about m squared, and m contains p3 and p4. Okay, so I, I did use a bit of knowledge that that p1, p3, and p4 are going to get fixed by energy momentum conservation. And so all I've really done here is I've done the delta function integration. Um, and this is d sigma d omega, by the way. Um, and then m m just I just use the the energy momentum kind of conserving delta. M is the same basically, just because it's totally fixed by energy momentum conserving delta functions. But this is one of the, these cases where if this was free body phase space here, then the delta functions wouldn't be enough to completely do the integral, and I have to do the leftover momentum integrals, and then the matrix element varies as I go across that integration, and so I have to do the last integral, including all the momentum variation in the matrix element, okay? So once you get up to three body, you have to worry about it more. Two body, these integrals always totally disappear except for d omega. 
just by doing delta functions. Okay. And then the last thing I might have to do is if I did want to do total cross-section studies, you do the integral over omega, and there's angle dependence in there. They should have been squared above that. That's what they should have been. They sit in M. M has that, and I just put them in as an afterthought because I knew they ended up down there. Okay, so I wasn't thinking. Okay, anything else on calculation stuff? So we'll come back and we'll interpret this next time. The other thing I should say, actually, I see a mistake already here. Let's just say it. We're doing real photons, so m is equal to zero. Okay, so it's real, exactly really photons. So there shouldn't have been any m there. And there, and there wasn't up at the top. Okay. As the end of the class approaches, the the errors mount up. <laughs>